If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. The world around us is an amazing place filled with beauty and with science. But let's face it, sometimes the science can be so confusing that it takes a PhD to understand it. Well, you're in luck. I just happen to have a PhD. Come and take a seat. Perhaps I can explain the world around us in a way we all can understand. Welcome to Conversations in Science. I'm Dr. Judy L. Moore. Call me Doc. guys and welcome 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 to another episode of conversations in science yes i am dr judy l moore and yes as my intro says i do actually have a phd and for those of you who are new to the show my cohort and producer jess where are you what's up doc Hey, Jess! It's Jesse's job to make sure that I don't go too technobabble so we, everybody can understand the science of what we're talking about for today. Well, today's topic, hmm. Oh, what you I got? What you got? What you got? Hmm. Okay, well, last month when I stole your show, ha <laughs> ha, that was so much yeah. fun. I still owe you for that. Maybe I got to do a combo science. Oh, yeah. good luck on that one. <laughs> oh, well, cold. anyway, when I stole your show, I spoke a little bit about the robot Sophia because Sophia had hit the news because Saudi Arabia had actually made Sophia a citizen. But, of course, there's a lot of things about robotics and artificial intelligence that needs to be considered now because of all of this. So I decided I was going to dial a friend someone who I know who happens to be an expert in this field. I want to welcome to the show today, Sean Welsh. Hello, Sean. Hi, Judy. How are you? Hi. Hey, Sean. How are you doing? (laughs) All right. So, Sean, you are an expert in this field. Why don't you tell our listeners what it is you actually specialize in and why and how you came interested in this topic? Sure. Well, my field is called uh, machine ethics, and machine ethics is about making moral decisions in robots and artificial intelligence. So it's sort of half science, half philosophy. So it's the the science bit is the AI and the robotics, and the philosophy bit is the ethics. Um, And I will say that the science is easy, right? I mean, we know how to make robots, and we know how to make AI, um, and it's getting better and better all the time. What's perhaps the challenge is putting the ethics into the robots and the AIs because we don't really fully have a complete understanding of um, 
how ethics works in human brains. Um, so that's the challenge. Um, so it's kind of like three laws of robotics stuff from Asimov. It's basically doing that, but doing it for real. And um, uh, people are starting to think about how can we get a robot to make a moral decision? And this is moving out of science fiction and into okay, science fact. Okay, wait, 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 Sean. I've never read Asimov's book. Can you tell me what the three laws of robotics are? Off the top of my head, uh, might not be exact, but the first law is a I've robot. got it. Uh, Judy has got I the book. I actually have it. I've prepared myself today. Um, okay, so exactly what they are, and we can talk about what these mean and how they and how they work. But Isaac Asimov had actually proposed in his short story, and we're talking going back to 1942. So these are quite old ideas. Well, the first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Seems simple enough. The the second law is a robot must obey the orders given by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So in theory... A robot can't be told, go and kill that person. Which, that's probably an interesting on its own. Uh, Number three is, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. And then, of course, there's some other um, robotic laws that came in within Isaac Asimov's science fiction a bit later on, but those are the three core ones. And I know the book I, Robot, it's, it's a selection of short stories that examine those laws and how they're flawed, how they have holes in them. Yeah, I think, I think that's the main point. So um, the three laws of robotics that Asimov wrote in, back in 1942, right, um, and the, the full context of that story, um, Asimov was making some fairly liberal assumptions about the future. So in that story written in 1942, in 2015, uh, we are supposed to be mining selenium on Mercury. And uh, in runaround, that original story, when the laws first appeared, uh, you know, humanity is on Mercury, we're mining selenium, and robots are actually banned on the surface of Earth. Uh, they're only allowed in space. So, um, But getting back to today and, and how relevant those laws are, Um, the first law has problems because supposing I have the trolley problem, right? So I, um, have you heard of this uh, thing called switch where you have the runaway trolley coming down the hill and you're standing there by the switch and there's five guys in one tunnel. If you do nothing, the trolley will run down and splatter the five people in tunnel A and kill them. Or if you throw the switch, the trolley will run down, uh, and splatter one guy in tunnel B. So, No matter what you do, you either have to harm humans or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. So a trolley problem is a real problem for the first law because, well, it can't do anything. It can't do A or B, but so it'll end up, you know, freezing and doing nothing. Um, And obeying orders, the second law is basically a problem. Supposing Judy says to the robot, post the letter, and I say to the robot, don't post the letter, clean the kitchen. Uh, what's the robot going to do? Who is the robot going to obey if both the orders are legal? Um, so there are problems with the three laws of robotics, and they're not generally regarded as plausible. And as Judy says, um, Asimov spent story after story sort of uncovering the bugs in the laws. So they're like a starting point, but they're not really taken very seriously uh, by people who are actually trying to encode ethics into AI today. So basically, Sean, Sean and Doc, these are the foundation. These are the little building blocks that people use to keep in the back of their mind, but they're really impractical when it comes to actually sitting down and writing the the computer code, right? Yeah, Yeah. the detail. The detail is the thing, right? Uh, As a general idea, it sounds great. Robots should not harm humans or through inaction allow humans to come to harm. Sometimes, however, your choice is between harming more or harming less humans, and that's all you've got. You don't have a, you know, ideal outcome. So it's points Isaac, of detail. Yeah. Yeah. Isaac Asinoff actually has a zeroth law as well. Yeah. Um, and he introduced that in the book Prelude to Foundation. And that, book, that one is a robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. And it was quite interesting because in Prelude to Foundation, it was it was this whole idea that 
Hitler was actually killed by a robot. <laughs> now, we know that wasn't true, but yeah. it's this whole thing of, you know, okay, well, what could have happened if Hitler had survived rather than when he died when he did? And so there is all those questions, and I think that's what we're sort of, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but that is basically what is at the core of this robot ethics situation. It's like, what do you do? How do we as humans make those decisions? Yeah. Um, with, the, with respect to the zeroth law, I mean, again, that's sort of been introduced to try and fix the bugs in laws one to three and all the shortcomings. <laughs> Um, and the zeroth law is, you know, but the, the zeroth law is potentially problematic as well um, with respect to the cinematic version of iRobot, which doesn't really follow the book exactly. But Vicky, the super intelligent computer, basically acts in accordance with the zeroth law because she arrives at the conclusion through her own remorseless logic and her super intelligence that if you leave humans to their own devices, they will do more harm to them, to each other than if the benevolent robot dictator takes over. <laughs> so, um, so Vicky decides to sort of stage a coup and disarm humanity and so on and so forth in order to um, uh, become the robot overlord for her own protection because we need <laughs> protection from ourselves. So um, this, bring, this actually brings up one of the, the great issues in robots at the moment, which is um, with respect to the autonomous weapons debate, which is the whole question of meaningful human control of robots. How do we stay in control of these artificial intelligences that in some respects are way smarter than we are already um, as they get smarter and smarter? So the whole question of keeping the lid on and staying in control of the AIs and the robots um, is a big issue. And it seems to me that there would need to be something like Asimov's laws, but I would say it'd be more like 3,000 or 3 million laws rather than three. It'd be a lot of very detailed laws, kind of like the laws that are already on the statute books. They have to be in the robots, and the robots have to obey them and, and not be able to change them. There's got to be some hard-coded or immutable normative rules that the robots cannot disobey. That's the essential idea of the three laws of robotics. It's the, that, the, that the robot cannot disobey them. They're sort of burnt into the positronic brain. So that's basically what we're trying to construct in machine ethics is we need to have a, an AI formalization which represents what we consider to be right and wrong, um, whether it's the law of the land, common decency, etc., etc. We have to encode all of that in AI and we have to ensure that the robot's are bound by those and select their actions in accordance with those um, uh, rules. But that's a, an enormous challenge. And it, at the moment, this research is only just starting. There are very few books in machine ethics at the moment. Um, I think there's about eight, actually. Uh, <laughs> Including your own. Yeah. So you know, in, in, in the whole of human history, like it's the first one came out in 2009, and uh, I think I'm number eight, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so it's a very I, embryo field, yeah. We will come back to your book um, later. But do the three – okay, so the three laws of robotics, they're not really relevant anymore, or do they just need to be totally just reworked, or – The sort of – the general ideas are fine, but in terms of the specific implementation, they're, they're just hopeless. So um, – you know, they you, you can't do a bad worse solution with the three with the first law. Um, you have to have a hierarchy of who's in charge for the second law, uh, and these things have already been sort of worked out. Um, like in that TV show Humans, they sort of have this concept of like a a primary user that can trump the orders of any other user. So you know, the father of the house sort of is the primary user, and then if the children say go post the letter, and the father says no, no, go and fix the car the robot will, there'll be a, a prioritization mechanism. Um, but it's mostly details. I mean, the laws, the spirit of the laws is fine. It's just the details of where they don't work. You have to patch up. And I just don't think talking about three is, you know, remotely adequate. Um, there's a lot of laws that you need to, a lot of 
even at a very high and abstract level of ethics, there's a lot of principles you need to um, express beyond, you know, not doing harm. Uh, what about fairness? Um, I can do you no harm but be quite unfair to you. Or what is harm? You have to define harm and so on and so forth. So you have to put very detailed meanings to these very abstract principles. So it's it's linking between the general principles and the specific actions that the robots do in specific situations that's that's the great challenge so you might have you know 10 or 20 top level laws but you're going to have hundreds and thousands of lesser laws which are subordinate to those high level laws and they're all very context dependent as well uh, speaking of context dependent where do we actually have ai being used now oh, where do we not have ai being used i mean ai is kind of in your phone, in your TV, in your yeah. fridge. Sorry, Doc. It's, it's, <laughs> I've got exactly. a robot that it's, it's vacuums like... my house. Exactly. What was I that? Mean... I've got a little, uh, one of those automatic little vacuum robots that will run around my house. Roomba. <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> I have children for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have host One of kitty. Great ethical arguments for robots is it eliminates slavery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> okay, so we've got them pretty much almost everywhere, but you know, I'm talking about these these high level. AI ones, the ones that really are making decisions rather than following a set of programmed responses. Um, where would we find those? Um, the most advanced sort of um, what you might call. So we talk about various kinds of robots. Um, there's like industrial yes, robots. So you have industrial robots which work on factory assembly lines, right? Very fast, very efficient, but they don't really have to deal with people. They just deal with, you know, putting the fender on the car and such and, and you know, welding and, and that kind of thing. So their industrial robots are very well understood. They've been developed for decades and very precise, but don't really have to deal with people. And we talk about social robots, and social robots do have to interact with people, and these are the ones that people are interested in. So the Roomba isn't really a social robot. You don't talk to it. Well, maybe you do, but <laughs> but no, the social robots I talk to um, host are the Kitty. ones that, like, say, like Honda Azimo, which is the prototype Honda, and then there's the SoftBank Pepper, which is going to be actually released as a product. It's already in sort of beta testing in Japan, and my understanding is um, this is a robot that's going to be in your house. It's going to answer the phone. It's going to take messages for you. It should be able to int intercept all those annoying, you know, telesales calls and say, oh, my Lord and Master Judy is not home at the moment. Would you like to leave a message? <laughs> and then boot it to the bit bucket. Um, but the, advertise the advertising for the, the pepper is it's going to be part of the family, right? And as they improve its capabilities, it, it should be able to get to the point where it can make you a cup of tea, um, open the door. Um, check up on Gran, make sure she's taken her medication. It w its functionality will gradually expand to include childcare and elder care and domestic cleaning. Can um, it order, domestic, me, you know. order me a pizza? Absolutely. That's quite easy. Pizzering is, is, is pretty easy, yeah. Um, uh, that's not difficult at all. Um, What's really difficult is something that involves a conversation with a human. This is, I mean, assuming that the robot, there's some sort of web service call interface that the robot could do to order pizza, which is not unimaginable. Um, but even if the robot has to sort of send an email or something or, or send a text to order pizza, that's generally fairly straightforward to set up. Um, so the robots, but the, what's really hard for a robot to do is like fold your laundry. That's insanely difficult. Loading your dishwasher is insanely difficult. If you ask the robot what the square root of 58,922,000 is, it'll take 0 0.01 of a second to answer that. But if you tell the state-of-the-art robot to fold a load of laundry, I think the state-of-the-art robot's taken about 45 minutes to do that, and it costs a million dollars, that robot. So, 
<laughs> um, okay, so it would take about 45 minutes for the load of laundry. Right. I think that's actually about the same amount of time that it takes my children to do the load of laundry. So, you know, it's not really much an advancement there. <laughs> yeah, they need to work on that one. But, um, but look, Judy, to give an idea of how fast this field is moving, you might have seen on the internet um, Atlas doing a backflip the other, the other week, maybe a week or two ago. So Atlas is this big clunky robot that's designed for sort of uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge um, about four years ago. And four years ago, this thing was falling on its face. It couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. It fell off. It fell on its back and it sort of was waving its arms and legs about like a cockroach on its back. It was, it was a completely useless robot in terms of doing anything agile. Just last week, this same robot, which is about six feet tall and weighs, you know, 200 kilos, it's a beast of a thing. It's jumping wow. up and down on boxes. It's turning around. And then it's doing a backflip like a gymnast and landing on its feet and not quite sticking it. It's a bit of a wobbly backflip. But, you know, it's about an eight out of ten backflip. Um, I so do the want to interject something here. Is insane. Very those, rapid progress. For those who don't what was know that, what... Jeff? For those who don't know what DARPA is, DARPA oh, it's the, is the Defense, Defense Advanced, Advanced Research, Research, Research Project Projects Agency. Agency. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm actually that's yeah. actually one I an acronym you threw that I knew, but I didn't know yeah, if your listeners would. There, Doc. No, not not all of my listeners would know that, um, but some of them would. <laughs> okay, so. We're we're getting some really intelligent or um, programming going into these robots and bits and pieces, and quite a few of them are having an impact on our everyday lives. I know, or the artificial intelligence algorithms, anyway. Because, like Siri, I mean, <laughs> my husband every day is using Siri. Not that I I have Siri turned off on my phone because my phone and I have a love hate relationship, but um. Yeah, it, it just little things like that are having an impact. Yeah, and I can see... There'll be, a, there'll be a psychology Siri, and it'll be able to talk to you about your Siri issues, Judy. It'll be saying, oh, Judy, tell me about your early childhood training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, did your, when did your hatred of mobile technology start? <laughs> you know, oh, it, it's not, it's not mobile technology. It's the fact that it's an iPhone, but we won't go there. We just will not go there. <laughs> yeah, me and iPhones. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> to be careful, some people <laughs> worship those things. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> okay. Right, the whole thing that sparked all of this conversation and me approaching you was Sophia. Yeah. And... Is Sophia intelligent enough to actually think outside of her programming in terms of her conversations? Her conversations seemed very much, let's talk about the weather. You know, th <laughs> there doesn't seem to be, let's have an in-depth, real yeah. conversation about her. Um, this is, um, so basically that functionality in a robot is basically the chatbot function, right? And chatbot functionality goes back to the 70s with Weizenbaum's ELISA program. Now, Weizenbaum had a secretary. And what ELISA, ELISA was a really simple, relatively simple program that was a text-based thing. So you would, you know, type a question to ELISA and it would give you a text thing back. So it was basically like texting the robot, basically. Um, a text interface, as per the Turing test, right, which is that's the test. You you have three people in the conversation, and, and the job of one of them is to, decide, is to decide which one is the man and which one is the woman, and one of the man or the woman can be a machine, and the test is passed when um, the human looking at this teletype can't figure it out better than chance which one is which. So... Chatbots have been around now, getting on to 50 years. Um, and they're insanely well-developed. But, yeah, they, they do run in fairly narrow boxes. And when you listen to them carefully, you sort of notice they do tend to have these bailout general responses when they don't know what to say back to you. 
But chatbots are pretty well advanced and they're good enough to fool a lot of people. Um, so Weizenbaum's secretary back in the day ended up having these fairly in-depth conversations with Eliza. And Weizenbaum was so horrified by this that this grown-up woman could start spending hours a day talking to Eliza that he actually took an offer <laughs> and banned her from using it because people can often um, just, you know, accept the chatbot's limitations and will work within them, so to speak. So chatbots are fairly mature. So all Sophia is is a walking, talking chatbot, really. Um, but She's not even walking yet. She doesn't have legs. Okay, so she's a yeah, she's she's a talking head. Yeah. She is. <laughs> she's she's just a talking head. <laughs> An expressive but the head, head. Head sort of moves and the lips sort of warm, warm, you know, do something. But yeah, she's basically a chatbot. She's no different to um, you know, the sort of chatbots that pop up on the internet a lot uh, for sales purposes. You know, you, you, when you actually think you're talking to a human, actually, the first few lines of dialogue will probably be a chatbot or an AI. And once your conversation gets interesting enough or hard enough, it might flag the attention of a human and you, you might not actually see the transition. Um, this technology is pretty mature because it comes out of those, you know, when you, you ring up some banks sometimes and you're talking to the robot, what they call um, interactive voice systems, IVRs. Those things are kind of like the same technology, the sort of natural language rec recognition and so on. So that's fairly mature. But, I mean, Sophia to me... Um, is basically a glorified chatbot. Uh, making her a citizen of Saudi Arabia is kind of, to me, it's it's a bit of a publicity stunt, really, um, because I gather the Saudis are promoting, they, they realize that they're going to run out of oil soon and they can't keep burning fossil fuels forever, so they're going to switch to, they're trying to stimulate some sort of robot park. I think they have an idea for an AI and robot park that they're going to think, and Sophia is part of this, come to Saudi Arabia and do robotics type project that the Saudi government has got. Um, but um, it does raise the issue of, um, I mean, to me, Sophia is just a computer program that has a natural language interface. That's it. There's nothing there that really is deserving of citizenship uh, in that it's a programmed artifact and it can't really go off its programming at all. Okay. Um, so let me make sure. I want to make one thing clear. Sophia is nothing like the one android, or at least quote-unquote android, that I think everybody will recognize. Start data! Exactly, <laughs> data. Data seemed to be able to think for himself. The only thing he couldn't do was have real emotions, at yeah. least not until the end, but that's a whole other issue. Yeah. But I mean, Commander Data is an interesting character. Um and it's, I mean, there is a lot of research underway in, what, in, in a field that's known as affective computing. And affect is basically emotion. So it's like computing emotions. And probably the most advanced, closest we have to commander data right now would be in Auckland, actually, uh, in New Zealand. And this is um, a product called the Auckland Face Simulator, which descends from a product called Baby X. And the brains behind this uh, startup, which is called Soul Machines, it's um, attracted about seven and a half million of venture capital funding from an Asian, um, you know, tech investor. Uh, the brains of this is a guy called um, Mark Sagar, whose background is from the Weta Workshop. Now, the Weta Workshop um, do special or did special effects for the Lord of the Rings, um, uh, the Hobbits, um, King Kong, and, and Avatar. Yeah. So this guy um, is actually now built, and a lot of that stuff is actually animation technology. It's it's the, you know the army of orcs is basically <laughs> a horde of killer robots, basically. <laughs> in that they're all little AIs which do their little thing and they coordinate their actions, and and you get these scenes with armies of animated orcs. Um, but that's all done with pixels. But it's fairly easy to to put those pixels into bodies. So the, the face, the Auckland face simulator is this um, startup, a product of soul machines. And it has this incredible neuroscience modeling under the hood. When you lift up, when you go into the back end of this, um, you can turn up 
like the cortisol level, which will make the, the, the face look scared. You can turn up the oxytocin level, which will make the face smiling, joyful, and happy. So you can tweak the um, – and the robot, right, can look at a human face through the web camera. It's not really a robot. It's, a, it's an AI. Uh, and it will look at your face. And if you're looking happy, well, it will sort of empathize with you or look like it's empathizing with you. If you're looking puzzled or confused – it will pick that up and it will feed that into its chatbot bit. So the project that they're working on at the moment uh, involves Nadia. Nadia is actually being voiced by um, Kate Blanchett, of all people, the actress. And the project is for the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia. And it's basically a, a chatbot that will talk to disabled people about what benefits they're entitled to through the NDIS system in Australia. So it's a a kind of um, navigate your way through the benefits bureaucracy chatbot. And it's got like a, a face that you can talk to that can display some emotion. So you can have like a webcam conversation with Nadia and it can, you know, you can be like a guy in a wheelchair or whatever, and it will sort of run you through the benefits you're entitled to and ask questions and act on a lot of the ways like a human having a fairly structured conversation about what form you have to fill in or, and answering your questions about what you're entitled to. That's, you know, happening today. That's actually in a beta test at the moment. So that's kind of, um, you know, uh, a chatbot that's very human-like in that it can, you know, talk. It sounds like Kate Blanchett. <laughs> it actually looks a bit Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett as well. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the actress, yeah. So it's, um, you know, awesome. yeah. But um, that's a that's a thing called Nadia. So that kind of you know interactive Siri that's doing something to help people who would otherwise be on hold, waiting for a human for half an hour, and all that sort of malarkey. Um, it's designing it designed to make the, at least the initial stages of an inquiry more efficient. I'll do anything to get off hold quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> I mean, I've spent an hour on hold before waiting to yeah. talk to someone. It's it's awful, isn't it? The thing I have to admit, when you started talking about that, the only thing that went through my mind is that scene from Demolition Man, where they've gone, you know, San Angeles police, you know, if you would like to speak to an automated person, please push the button now. It was just so <laughs> funny. It's like, really? <laughs> We're always wanting to talk to a human, but yet you want us to talk to an automated person. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This is the really interesting thing. I mean, if you can talk to an automated person about something that's fairly routine and you can get onto that automated person right then or you're going to wait 20 minutes for the human or 40 minutes or an hour, I think a lot of people will just, you know, you know what, I'll talk to the automated person. And what will happen is the automated chatbot type things will triage the calls anyway. So if it's something that a robot can actually do, it's fairly routine like, you know, um, it would just deal with it. And if it's something that had to be escalated to a human, then it would be escalated to a human and they'd call you back. Um, I expect to see that kind of thing happen a lot in tech support for phone companies. Um, at the moment, you know, you talk to a person in the Philippines or something like that, and it can be quite frustrating. Um, um, I think I'd rather talk to Nadia. <laughs> Because at I least I'll that, know that Nadia I will have read that. the tickets. <laughs> All right, Jess, you were saying something? I second that. Sometimes I'd rather be talking to the robot because sometimes the humans are just, well, annoying. Yeah, they, they asked yeah, the question they're... that a different human asked three calls ago. That really gets up my snout. It's in the ticket. Read the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I already said that. Why do you not okay. remember? Okay. <laughs> I tried that. I tried that. Hey, Doc, I know we're going yeah. goofy here, but guess what time it is? Yeah, I was just thinking that myself. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, Jess, it's all yours. Run those ads, please. Yes. And we'll come right back. It's time to pay the bills, Doc. Hello there, this is Nat King Cole wishing you all a happy and a Merry joy Christmas. The joy of living is in the giving. So let's give lots of toys for tots. 
Since 1947, the United States Marine Corps has been helping Santa fill his sleigh, making happier holidays for deserving children right in your community. Go to toysfortots.org and learn how you can make a difference. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Hey guys, guess what? We're done with commercials. And we're ready to talk about more robots. today. Okay, wonderful. But for those of you who are just joining us now, we are talking today with Sean Welsh, who is an expert in robot ethics. We've been talking about the three laws of robotics, and we've been talking about various different things about 
<laughs> what sort of artificial intelligence we have. Sean, I want to know more about this laundry folding robot because I oh, really yeah. could use some help folding my laundry right now. I, I, the, domestic, the domestic slavery replacements are the one that's going to free your children. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, don't free them. Don't. No, they're not ready to go out into the world. I haven't taught them everything I need them to do. Well, the one that will free you, <laughs> the one that will, you know, cook and clean and fold and scrub. We already have a robot that can sort of, you know, vacuum your carpets and uh, mop your floors. Um, but you really want one that's going to be able to stack the dishwasher, put it on, add the, the detergent, unload the dishwasher and not break all the glasses. You want one that's going to go into, you know, ground zero, which is the children's bedroom, and pick up all of that mess. Just pick up the socks, pick up the underpants with all the unspeakable atrocities. Oh. That you know. <laughs> like this is, this, is, this is the liberation, right? This is what gets me excited. A robot that can just come around your house and tidy up and clean and maybe wash the windows and do all of this stuff which is fairly boring and kind of programmable. Um, so, but is hard for robots to do because of the tactile dexterity that's required and also getting the cost down to where it's affordable. Um, like that laundry folding robot at the moment takes 45 minutes to fold one load. That's just to fold one load of laundry, by the way. Um, you know, somebody else actually did the laundry. <laughs> to get a robot, though, that can... Uh, like a, a robot that's at a price point of say two or three or four thousand dollars that can do that, and that's basically what the SoftBank Pepper will sort of head towards. But the initial release is it's fairly, it's not really there yet. You know, it's basically kind of like a walking, talking mobile phone handset um, that can do a few extra things, but. They've designed it so that you'll be able to download updates and the updates will enable the robot to do more more stuff and they want to sort of open it up so that third-party developers can say, you know, wouldn't it be cool if Pepper could scrub your windows and somebody will add a scrub windows module to Pepper? Um, and so Pepper will, you know, gradually become this sort of, like your PC, you can just download programs which enable you to do different things with your robots as they, they'll, they'll be basic sort of chassis and then you'll download some extra AI which will enable it to do something a bit smarter. So you'll get that kind of model. Um, so that's what's really exciting, I think, of the domestic robot that just, you know, cooks, cleans, answers the phone for you. Um, <laughs> I was thinking if I, I, I it's the one that's going to answer the door when those troublesome people come around and want to talk to you about somebody. Yeah. I think I, the painful I, marker and it says, get off my property in the Terminator voice. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to talk to you about Buddha. Get off my property. Hasta la vista. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> I think I would settle for a robot that could take, that could cook. And yeah. do laundry. I mean, really, take the rubbish out. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. In Christchurch, just... we've got those organic bins. We've got, you know, we separate our rubbish out, and we've got this organic Ooh. bin. I don't know about yours, Sean, but it's mine. Nice. Oh my god, is it rank? It it is awful. just really awful, foul smelling. And the fact that we're heading in summer is only making it worse. Yeah, but. Yeah. Honestly, you know, my kids, they're like, you know, rock, paper, scissors. Who's going to take out the rubbish? Because yeah. nobody wants to deal with that din. And it's like, hey, you know, we'll send a robot. That sounds good. <laughs> a robot can take out the rubbish. Yeah. Hey, Doc, Actually, you know, I need help robot, taking yeah, out my rubbish, a... too. Nobody wants me taking out my rubbish. Yeah, yeah. the last time you took out your rubbish, you broke your arm. <laughs> what you don't know, Sean? is I'm in a wheelchair. Oh, my God. <laughs> and to take the rubbish out, our driveway is a straight downhill. Well, uh -huh. needless to say, one time my front wheels went off the curb first, which put me face first on the street. 
Ouch. Yeah, and she broke her hand as a consequence. <laughs> yeah, well, you in tried... In the future, the robot will be able to, you know, <laughs> do that for you. Um, and it will be able to take... You'll be able to sort the rubbish too. Like you'll be just sitting there right on your sofa and you'll open up a bar of candy. You just toss this bit of paper and silver wrapping on the floor and the robot will pick it up and it will put the paper in the paper recycling and the silver wrapping in the silver wrapping recycle and the beer cans and the wine bottles and everything else uh, that you find on Judy's floor. Um, (laughs) Excuse me? (laughs) Robot, I'll just pick it up and take it away. And uh... Doc, best <laughs> guest ever. <laughs> yeah. hmm, Sean, it will keep. It will keep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just right. it off, you know, and it won't get bored and it won't complain like Judy's children. If you listen to Judy's <laughs> children, oh my God, it's like a never ending scratched record of woe and misery. Oh, we shush, suffer. shush, shush, shush. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are all excited about this idea of having this robot that can clean our house and take out the rubbish, oh. Oh, please, oh. and all these other things. Are there any other robots that have you excited and please don't go there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what I want to ask. Uh, I know what I want to ask, Doc. <laughs> I got a robot question. Um, there Just, are some very cool robots um, that I've seen. Um, there's a Japanese prototype robot that's kind of semi-mysterious, but it has amazing walking abilities. Um, but I think they're the company that bought the um, Boston Dynamics are the ones that made the Atlas robot that did the backflip. I think it's basically the same Japanese firm that's bought that. I think SoftBank bought Boston Dynamics. So they seem to be buying all the really trick robot stuff at the moment. And um, I've just seen some, this is a robot, like robots traditionally have struggled with uneven surfaces, like walking along a rocky, bouldery, sort of beachy environment. And this robot was just running up it, you know, like it was, had amazingly, it was amazingly sure-footed bipedal robot. Had a quite a radical design, but just, you know, awesome. So it seems to me that the robots are getting increasingly agile and increasingly dexterous. And so they'll become increasingly useful. Um, so it, the progress is, you know, quite rapid. Um, it's only a matter of, I mean, at the moment they're very, very expensive, these prototypes, but it's like everything in IT and AI and robotics, the price will come down with each year. So, you know, what is now a $2 million robot will be a $200,000 robot will be a $20,000 robot will be a $2,000 robot in maybe five or 10 years. So, um, you'll have this amazing, um, productive ability uh, with robots. I mean, there are already robots that can mow your lawn as well. We haven't even talked about the garden yet. Uh, so the robot that can, you know, prune prune the roses, that can trim the trees, that can trim the hedge. That's not I got that a far question. away either. There's already lawnmower robots in production. So, um, hey, Sean, you know, as they I got a question. How far away from are we from having a real commander data that can work for the U.S. military? Um, Commander Data is fairly smart. I mean, Commander Data can, you know, have a kind of a, a conversation and think about tactics and strategy and also think about human psychology a bit. Um, but that Nadia robot, that uh, Auckland face simulator is a long way towards this recognizing human emotion already, you know, whether you're happy, you're sad, you're confused, you're angry, it, that's already perceivable. Now that doesn't mean the robot can feel anything but he can recognize that jesse is happy or sad or frustrated or confused or whatever but it's not going to empathize with you because it it itself does not feel anything and it doesn't really have like a conscious self like we do so it's not really clear actually whether commander data actually has a conscious self i mean you just look at it from the outside and you don't really know but because what humans do when they look at something like commander data we assume that there's a consciousness in there. Um, so we, 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 they talk about projecting theory of mind, right? We just assume that anything that's animated has got some wants and some desires and some needs, and we explain agency, the ability to make decisions in, determ- in terms of what it wants or what it's trying to get. So 
we just project all of this stuff uh, and, and we project our own emotions onto things as well. So um, we just assume that commander data has got all of this feelings in it when in reality it might just be a bunch of software code executing and it's, you know, not actually conscious, but it can act as if it is conscious. And that's quite a tricky distinction. Um, but in terms of, you know, answering your question, I mean, you could cobble together. So, I mean, commander data is basically Sophia, right? The head of Sophia, which exists with better affective stuff. So with the Nadia type um, uh, affective computing, plus being able to walk around. So you want the Atlas type Magility, which already exists, plus um, the super intelligence, in which case, you know, you plug it into Watson as its back end. Um, so with those things that are already lying around, like the agility of the Atlas, the sort of emotional smarts of Nadia, the ability to have a basic con conversation of any chatbot, um, plus the mobility, um, you're getting pretty close. Uh, and with the sort of ability to learn new tricks that Watson uh, gives you, or maybe AlphaGo Zero type technology gives you. I know one more thing you'd need to add. As far away from commander data as you'd think. I Maybe know one, 10 to 20 years. one more thing you'd need to add. You'd probably need to put in a database of the entire Library of Congress. <laughs> well, that, well Watson, Watson can do that already. I mean, the Jeopardy bit of Watson can, can give you pretty much the whole of whatever knowledge base you want. So, yeah. So Watson gives you that potentially already. Um, so you get all of that factual, being able to just look up, you know, who flew the first plane, whatever, just bang, it's there. So, yeah, um, that stuff, you know, the bits and pieces you need to build, that sort of thing, are sort of in existence. So um, the main thing that we're still missing is, like, the ethical dimension, you know, the moral compass. So uh, we don't really have an ability to formalize that yet. But that's the area that I'm interested in, and that's uh, – that is basically what my book is about, actually. <laughs> so how do you build a moral compass in a robot? Well, you get a bit of magnetic steel and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the okay. to come back. <laughs> All right. So, so the moral compass, obviously, is, is the biggest question with that. So as a consequence, on the other sort of side of that, where are some of these things heading that could actually be just scary. Um, there's a lot of things that people are scared about with robots. The most commonly cited is the what they call mass technological unemployment. Right, this is um, if we if we do develop the domestic robot that can you know cook and clean and scrub, um, all the people who get paid to cook and clean and scrub at the moment won't be employable because the robot will do it cheaper and faster um uh, not necessarily that laundry folding sorry 45 <laughs> minutes but give it a give it five years it'll get down to four minutes and and so on um and at the moment the cost factor is prohibitive but extrapolating a few years down the track maybe 20 years down the track you might have it that any old household robot that you can buy for a couple of thousand dollars that looks like Chappie or one of those robots in the movies that can, you know, walk and talk and do stuff. Um, so there's unemployment is a huge issue. You know, what are we going to do with people? And it's not just like basic blue collar stuff. It's really advanced white collar stuff like lawyers and surgeons. Um, you know, IBM's Ross is basically a legal front end to Watson, which could put paralegals out of work and eventually lawyers and possibly eventually barristers and, and judges even um there's already a robot that did surgery stitching up a pig to a standard better than human stitching up a pig so there's a lot of robot surgical robots that already exist they're kind of like surgeon accessories but they might actually become surgeon replacements down the track um there's the military robots um the military robots obviously could uh swarms of you know um evil or malevolently programmed machines could engage in massacres and terrorism and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, uh, uh, what Terminator? Yeah. We're going to have we, Terminators. We already sort of do sort of have some robots that can shoot the enemy. 
Um, so, for example, the Patriot anti-missile system, the Israeli Harpy Fire and Forget anti-radiation missiles. These things at the moment have got very specific missions, right? Patriot basically shoots anything coming at you doing Mach 2 or higher in the sky or um, flanks, which is the one the Navy use, can actually shoot a speedboat or a, an incoming missile completely automatically without any human involvement beyond switching it on and saying, you know, the stuff has hit the fan, we're being attacked. They hand it over to the close-in weapon system and it shoots down whatever is coming at it. And it can't really tell whether there's a human flying a kamikaze plane or whether it's just a missile because it's just a, you know, a blip on the radar coming in at Mach 2 or Mach 1 or whatever the speed is. So we already have these autonomous weapons, uh, like there's a sentry robot on the border with North Korea, um, which the South Koreans deployed about 10 years ago now. And this is basically at the moment, it can be remotely piloted, but it can switch to an autonomous mode. So, you know, if you've got 600 North Koreans charging over the DMZ, you can sort of sit there with the button and just hit them one by one yourself, or you can switch the machine allegedly to autonomous mode and just let it shoot the 600 targets all by itself. So that sort of weaponry, autonomous weapons, already exists. And what worries people is that you could put this into more um, smaller and agile platforms and make them more offensive, like you could make a, a Predator drone or a Reaper drone completely autonomous uh, without, um, if you get the ability to recognize targets is good enough. And there are, of course, some targets which are easier to recognize than others. So... Um, it's fairly straightforward to send an unmanned weapon to destroy a static target, such as a telephone exchange or a bridge. I mean, tomahawks can do that today. You just put in a coordinate and the, the, the missile will make its own way there. Um, you don't actually have to hand steer it onto its target. Likewise, with these future drones in particular, um, it's entirely possible that drones could be programmed to destroy tanks or trucks or bridges or targets of opportunity, even, you know, infantry, um, without any human fingers on the trigger at all. So that's got a lot of people worried. Um, the whole automation of warfare business. Uh, and there's um, discussions at the United Nations about whether this sort of stuff should be banned or regulated and where the line should be drawn as to what is to be tolerated uh, by the international community and what should be banned. So, um, you know, you might ban something like Skynet, for example, and you might ban certain kinds of offensive robot. But that's all up for debate um, because there are some positives with such machines in theory. So, for example, supposing, I mean, there are some missions that infantry do which are very dangerous, house-to-house um, -house room clearing, for example, is very dangerous because the enemy can be lying in wait, hiding behind civilians and so on and so forth. So if the robot is the first into the room, the enemy can shoot the robot and it's like, well, nobody really cares if the robot gets shot. And the robot can say there's an enemy in this room and then they can send in a little flying drone hand grenade type robot to go and blow the enemy up or shoot them in the head. So from a, depending on how you frame the problem, um, and how much control you have over what the robot is doing and how, how short a leash it's on or how long a leash it's on, you can see a lot of advantages of robots in military contexts. Um, the, the uncontroversial thing is a bomb disposal robots. Nobody has any great problem with bomb disposal robots, um, but it's the robots that are tasked with actually shooting the enemy that are controversial. Some people seem to think uh, there should always be a human involvement in this, the decisions to actually... Uh, shoot um, a human being and that should be a real-time decision so um, that kind of thing uh, there's a lot of dis debate about you know what should be permitted what should be banned and that sort of sits in the context of what is actually technically possible because what people talk about as possible military applications of robots is not always doable but it's foreseeable it's fairly um, to me, it seems fairly clear that anything an infantryman can do in 10 or 20 or 30 years, a robot will be able to do faster and better. Um, so it might well be that infantry become obsolete in the future of war. Um, Ooh, so. That's not going to be fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
All right. So moving away from the military robots and, and those sort of things and coming back to, say, Sophia. Yeah. All right. When Sophia was made a citizen of Saudi Arabia, there, there was quite a few conversations on the Internet about some of the conversations that we are going to have to think about eventually. Yeah. But this has brought forward to the ground. It, it's things like, you know, what sort of rights should we be giving AI and, and those sorts of things? Are we even ready for those conversations? Um, people have started, like in the academy, certainly. There are some people who have been talking about robot rights now for several years. Um, it's not, you know, a brand new idea, but most people still seem to think that it's kind of, Yes, in theory, if you make some large technical assumptions, then you would give um, a robot some rights. Uh, to me, the critical thing is, um, well, the, the, the analogies people make is it seems to me fairly straightforward to sort of give um, a robot, which is, you know, tin can with some thinking in it, much the same rights as, say, a company has. A robot could plausibly be a, an agent of a company and have the same rights as a company has because it, the robot is just the company. Uh, so it can, you know, buy and sell things and it can contract to do stuff and it can pay and be paid and, um, and so on and so forth. So that kind of nuts and bolts rights seems fairly straightforward to implement. Um, the question of punishing a robot, of course, if the robot does wrong, uh, is very difficult because until you can build a robot that can actually suffer and can actually feel pleasure and pain um, or can actually feel anything, uh, at the moment we, we can't actually build consciousness and feeling in a robot. We can process data in a robot and we can process data about feelings so Nadia can recognize whether you're happy or sad, and it can have a line in its data processor saying Judy is happy and Jesse is sad or vice versa, but it can't actually empathize with your happiness or sadness. If it's going to do something, it's going to be following rules. So robots are still rule following things. Um, and, the newer machine learning AI has a capacity to sort of discover some rules, but it will discover the rules according to its training data and its training algorithms. So they're still a long way from being things that can feel pleasure and pain that you can hold morally responsible in particular, and that you could punish if they did moral wrong. They're still basically mechanical devices like clockwork. It's a bit, Odd, And it might be very complicated and sophisticated clockwork, but it's very hard to sort of really be giving human rights type rights, like the right to life and the right to liberty and the right to the pursuit of happiness to something that's not actually alive, that doesn't really know freedom from servitude and which um, doesn't really feel happy or sad. It doesn't feel anything. So some rights are kind of misplaced. The right to buy and sell, though, um, is kind of already delegated to machines. Um, stock trading AIs, for example, you know, buy and sell on behalf of the companies that own them already. So that kind of thing is fairly straightforward, but it's the more the human rights, I think, which are difficult to see being delegated to robots until such time as we can build consciousness and we can build feelings. But nobody has any clue how to do that at the moment. We don't really fully understand how human consciousness works. We don't really fully understand how human feelings work. Um, as individual people, we know what consciousness is and we know how feelings feel. But nobody has a clear idea how to build this from scratch. Um, so until we have that idea, until neuroscience gets to the point, this is how you build consciousness. Starting from scratch, you need two eggs, a whisk, and a bowl, or whatever. <laughs> Um, until you can build consciousness and build feelings, it's hard to see, you know, the rights thing getting to the same level as humans. I think that sounds sort of fair. Um, okay, so basically, this whole area is just 
it really comes down to us just not having a full understanding of how we are going to program this information. And it really is, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. I mean, even our own human brains really are a bunch of zeros and ones, but how they evolved into something else, I don't know. And I don't think anybody else really knows the answer to that either. Yeah, that's what, that's um, what they call the, the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's called a reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, because I, re- I remember there is an episode in um, Star Trek TNG where they talk about sentience and, and they talk about, yeah. you know, a soul. And I seem to remember distinctly, that, I mean, because it was all about whether Data was property or whether he wasn't. And yeah. and the at the end of the day, the whole argument came down to, did Data have a soul? And yeah. I seem to remember that judge in that episode went through and said, you know, do we, as humans, have a soul? What is a soul? Nobody knows. Yeah. We can't define it. No, no. But most humans will understand to what that refers, right? Oh. Yeah. Whether you call it a soul or your spirit or phenomenal consciousness or just consciousness, um, most of us know that we have a self, that we feel, that we suffer, we have joy, we have a range of emotions. So that, the being able to think of yourself as a person that has a character that makes decisions for which you can be held morally responsible, all that kind of stuff, that legal accountability stuff. Um, It's hard to see a robot getting to that point. Though, look, you know, um, maybe we're just around the corner from it. Maybe it's 50 years away. Maybe it's 100 years away. Yeah. Okay. So So difficult to predict that one. So this area of science, (laughs) which is a crossbreed, obviously, with philosophy, um, you said there were only like eight or nine books, eight or nine. That's it. Yours is one of them. Yes. Tell us about your book. Well, my book has got the rather um, daggy title. It's called Ethics and Security Automata. And it's about the morality of robots using force against human beings. And this is kind of like Asimov's first law stuff. Um, So some of the moral examples I talk about are the switch problem and the footbridge problem. So the switch problem is that one where you've got the runaway trolley and the robot can either throw the switch, well, the robot can do nothing, in which case five people die, or the robot can throw the switch in which one person dies. How does the robot solve that problem? And that problem is called switch. Then there's another problem called footbridge, which is kind of similar, in that you have the runaway trolley, and there's five people in the tunnel will get killed. But instead of throwing the switch and diverting the robot, you push the fat man onto the rails, and the robot hits the fat man, oh, sorry, the runaway trolley hits the fat man, and, and it derails, and the five people in the tunnel don't get killed because you've pushed the fat man off the footbridge. Now, most people say that in the switch case, it's all right to throw the switch, but they resist the fat man case. They don't think it's right to push the fat man, but you're still ending up with one person being sacrificed to say five. And in the switch case, people are sort of fine with that. But in the footbridge case, they're not. So you have to sort of explain what's what's underlying this intuition. How is this intuition different? So what I do in my book is I sort of say, well, how is a robot going to arrive at these conclusions? And I just assume that the humans are right. So I accept that, you know, throwing the switch is fine in switch, but pushing the fat man is wrong in uh, footbridge. And you have to come up with some AI that can appreciate the difference uh, in terms of the action on these two patients. So um, that's the kind of calculation I do. And this involves a lot of um, what they call knowledge representation and reasoning. And you have to make some distinctions about risk assumption and desert and innocence and so on that you can use to justify uh, throwing the switch in one case but to reject pushing the fat man in the other and that's mostly to do with re- assuming risk and other things like that. So it's kind of um, stepping through these problems individually and coming up with code that can solve them and then using similar code to solve other problems. So basically, I just take a set of ethical test cases 
and say the right answer is I, I set up the thing is here's the situation, runaway trolley, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if this happens, this ha it has this consequence. If this happens, this is the consequence. What's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is A. You have to write code that gets to that decision. And then you repeat the cycle with test after test after test. And in that way, you try and understand how ethics works or can be made to work at a, at a computational level. So that, in short, is machine ethics. And that's basically what my book is about. Um, I just do lots and lots of similar examples uh, in which I try and figure out from a robotics perspective and an AI perspective how a robot would actually make a moral decision. And it's quite interesting because it forces you to bring up to the surface a lot of stuff that you just do unconsciously with intuition as a human being. You have this sense of what's right and wrong, and that's not sort of fully documented. People trust their instincts. They trust their moral intuitions. But when you do it in AI, you have to sort of lift up the lid on that and spell it all out from scratch in lines of code. And that forces a degree of clarity that you don't get when people are just using their intuitions. Um, so that, in essence, is what uh, the book is about. Mostly I talk about security decisions, decisions involving, um, you know, harm to humans. Um, there's a lot of famous cases in the literature. There's the, you know, the Kanchen case when the axe murderer is at the door asking the whereabouts of your sister. Um, there are other famous cases in the ethics literature that I formalize and solve using AI. Cool. So where would we be able to get a copy of your book? Um, it's on Amazon. Um, it's an academic book. So, you know, it's kind of primarily intended for university libraries. I don't expect it to become a bestseller or anything like that. Um, it's a Routledge book. So you can just Google the title Ethics and Security Automata. It pops up. And um, it's it's on Routledge as well. Um, Ethics, uh, sorry, Routledge's site, the Amazon site. I'm sure it's um, fairly easy to find online. Cool. Right, Jess, do you have any questions for Sean? No, I think I've got more robot thinking to do because guess what, Doc? What? We're out of time. Yeah, I know. I was sort of watching the clock today. So, Sean, if anybody has any questions about robot ethics or about the work that you've been doing or any of the topics that we've been talking about today, how do people get in touch with you? Best way is to just tweet me. So um, my Twitter tag is at Sean underscore Welsh 77. So that's S-E-A-N underscore W-E-L-S-H 77. Uh, my Twitter hashtag. Um, so I'll respond to tweets. Um, or I have a website, um, which is fbot.nz. So that's F-B-O-T dot N-Z. Uh, which is my startup, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm working on that cleaning robot. <laughs> oh, yes, please. And, and and just make sure and, you know, clean out the rubbish bin as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah please. Yeah. Oh, you, right? yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah, okay. No more rock, paper, scissors for me on that one. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Well, Thank you very much, Sean. There are so many things to be thinking about. And yeah, I knew you were the right person for this. I so knew you were the right person. <laughs> no, okay, no Jess. Right, Jess and Sean, thank you. I think, Jess. Yeah, we've Doc. Hit the end. We've hit the end. I think so too. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Well, that brings us to an end of another Conversations in Science. If you have any questions about science and about some of the world around us, feel free to drop me a line. I'm on Twitter, and you can find me at Judy L. Moore, or you can look me up on Facebook, Judy L. Moore, or you can drop me a line on my personal website, JudyLMoore.com. I think you're seeing the pattern here. Then, of course, if you are interested in some of the other projects I do, which is the writing and editing, feel free to check me out on blackwolfeditorial.com. But then, of course, don't forget, if you are wanting more information about the science, you can also contact us at the station with the email of science at klrnradio.com. 
then, of course, there's my cohort that keeps going through and popping up. You mean me, Doc? Well, for anybody who wants to track me down, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. And you can also drop me a line at the station at Jesse's POV at KLRNRadio.com. Bye, guys. Bye.